around 175 years ago, there appeared briefly, sort of like a meteor in the sky, the ministry of a young man in Scotland whose testimony uh, continues to uh, have ripple effects some 200 years later, nearly. He entered the pastorate in, in 1836 at the age of 23. He would only serve in ministry for six years. He died in a typhus uh, epidemic when he was only 29. Still his brief life influenced so many throughout Scotland and, and beyond to surrender their lives to the mastery of Christ. If you read much of Robert Murray McShane uh, and his life or his, his journal, you'll come away with a clear impression that he was preoccupied with God. He was preoccupied with the character of God. He was preoccupied with the grace of God. He was preoccupied with the Word of God. He was preoccupied with delivering the gospel of God. On one Lord's Day, in one sermon where he challenged believers, and I want to I sort of launch from this quote, and set the, set the tone for today's study, McShane said to his congregation, remember, you are God's sword, His instrument, a chosen vessel unto Him to bear His name. In great measure, according to the purity of the instrument, will be its success. It is not great talent that God blesses, so much as great likeness to Jesus Christ. A holy Christian is an awesome weapon in the hand of God. I think the Apostle Peter would say amen to that and that kind of dedication to pursue the likeness and holiness of, of God. Now, if you were with us in our last discussion, we ask the question, how do you become and stay clean? What are the steps to staying clean in an unclean culture? How do you pursue holiness in an unholy world? And we focused on four steps before we ran out of time. So let me invite your attention back to your copy of the New Testament and at 1 Peter chapter 1 where we've arrived at, at chapter 1 and verse 13. And since today is a continuation of last Lord's Day, and uh, some of you may not have been there in that discussion, and those of you who were forgot, uh, let me just kind of briefly go over the four, and I've written them in my notes because I forgot to, okay? Here we go. The first step in staying clean we talked about was simply this, uh, get a handle on your thought life. Get a handle on your thought life. Notice how Peter writes in verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. And I referenced the old King James translation. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. And the analogy is to girding up the loose fabric. And in this analogy, girding up the loose fabric of your thought life and tucking it all in so it doesn't get in the way as you attempt to run your race unencumbered for Christ. Get a handle on your thought life. The second step to staying clean is get a grip on your emotions. Peter writes next, keep sober in spirit that is internally, stay sober, don't begin to live as if you're intoxicated. Don't panic, don't get carried away. You can render it, stay level-headed. In these days, this was desperately needed as it is in these days. Stay level-headed. The third step to staying clean is get focused on your future. He writes next, fix your hope, that is, pin your expectation completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, Christians are to live in the future tense. And, and we use as an illustration an engaged couple who saves up money, who makes different kinds of plans. The, the bride-to-be begins to gather things in that hope chest so appropriately named. They are determining every action and, and every decision in the present tense in light of the future tense and their lives together. 
So, of course, the application would be that we, as the bride of Christ, we are making decisions, we are making our plans in light of the fact that our bridegroom is going to be revealed at the revelation of Jesus Christ, and we will soon enter into his glory and his Father's house. And then step number four is simply this, get rid of old habits. He writes in verse 14, as obedient children do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. The word for lusts was simply, we said, a summary of the sinful, self-centered, self-seeking, self-praising, corrupt desires that drive the children of disobedience. Paul calls them that in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2. But you, on the other hand, are children of obedience. And so these are now your former lusts, which means in a very encouraging way, these patterns can be broken. Now, he doesn't mean to say that a believer will never be self-seeking or self-serving, that a believer will never lust again. But what he says, in effect, is that the believer is no longer choosing to pattern their lives after those lusts, those habits. Now, as children of obedience, they are driven by the Spirit, intoxicated, as it were, by the Spirit, pursuing the fruit of the Spirit. And with that fourth step, we were out of time, right? That is, we wanted to eat lunch, and we did, so we stopped there. And I promised you last Lord's Day that, Lord willing, we would cover two more points today. But since I had a whole week to study, (laughs) I came up with five more. So (laughs) this is just going to go on and on. If I had another week, it'd be more, right? That's just like you. I mean, look, look, every time you go to this, this book, every time you study a passage, or even if you're reading in your quiet time a passage you've read before, there's something new to taste, isn't there? There's something new to savor every time you open this loaf of bread. Well, it happened to me, so we got a lot of new things. But what I'm going to do for our study today is, is I will give you two more steps in becoming and staying clean in an unclean culture. And what I'll do uh, for the sake of sanity, is, is, is fit the other points as subpoints into the second point. Here we go. Step number five, and how to stay clean. Get serious about your calling. Verse 15, but like the Holy One, who called you? Now pause. Who called you? Don't miss that. This is one of the favorite concepts of the Apostle Peter, and and it's, it's important to mention. Most people think that only pastors are called by God, that there's no special calling in life for all the other Christians in the Christian, you know, community of believers. Just you guys are called, you know, pastors, elders, missionaries. You guys have the calling from God, and, you know, the rest of us, I guess we're left without it. Listen, that is exactly what the devil would love for you to think. Why? Well, for one, it discourages you from any sense that your life has a calling of God upon it. You know, that for you, I guess, it, you're, just, you're, you're just confined to the mundane. Uh, there isn't anything special about His calling in your life. But worse is the perspective that that lets you off the hook. You guys are called, not me. You, you're professionals. You know, this is your livelihood. This is what you do. And God hasn't called me to anything special. That's for pastors and missionaries and elders. No, no, Peter, in the context here, is writing, remember, as he opened the letter, to all the believers that are scattered all around Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia, scattered around, planted as seed, is how you ought to think of it, uh, planted by the hand of God as he scatters them like seed, covering 750,000 square miles in the region that he just delivered to us. They and you are called by God to serve uh, him wherever he has planted you, in whatever he has called you, 
to do. There is a sacred vocatio. The word vocatio means sacred calling. We lost it in the Middle Ages. The Reformation has attempted to resurrect the idea that there isn't a unique calling, a special calling, a closeness to God in the calling of someone who is vocationally involved because a vocatio is sacred. Whether you're in a, an apartment surrounded by dirty diapers and dirty dishes, that is his, at this moment in your life, his sacred calling. Whether you're performing surgery on someone or you're changing the oil in a client's automobile, that is his special calling. Where you get to demonstrate the character of God, by the way, where I can't. You can. As you're scattered, demonstrate this preoccupation for a holy God. Peter, by the way, uses this concept of calling often. He, in chapter 2, verse 9, says that we've all been called out of darkness into a marvelous light. Over in, in, in chapter 2 and verse 21, we've been given a calling to model the, the self-control of Christ in the face of persecution or troubling times. In chapter 3 and verse 9, we've all been given a calling that will ultimately flow into an inheritance that is, is undiminishable and boggles the imagination. Even into his second letter, Peter almost immediately brings this word calling out again as he tells us that we are called to a life of godly excellence in whatever we do. Beloved, you all have a unique calling from God. Now, the calling Peter is emphasizing here is that we've all been given a unique calling to holiness. And it isn't just for a few people. It's for the church. It's for the family of God, the children of God. So get serious about this calling. Look at verse 15 again. But like the Holy One who has called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior. Part of staying clean is understanding that God has called you to pursue holiness and in that pursuit, we're going to get serious. Why? Because that calling requires decisions and, and demands disciplines. It isn't just going to happen. Nobody's going to get holy in a hurry. Nobody's going to get holy by accident. You're not going to grow up accidentally in Christ. D.A. Carson, who has preached for me in this pulpit in the past, said in an interview a few years ago, these words, I felt them fitting here upon this uh, thought or topic. Christians, he, he said, do not drift toward holiness. Apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate toward godliness, prayer, obedience to Scripture, faith, delight in the Lord. No, we drift toward compromise and call it tolerance. We drift toward disobedience and call it freedom. We drift toward myths and call it faith. We, we cherish indiscipline and call it relaxation. We slide toward godlessness and convince ourselves we are escaping legalism. So those who take their calling seriously will fight against that gravitational pull every day of our fallen nature, which is no friend to holiness. We, we fight against the undertow of a fallen world, worldly pressure. We refuse to drift along in the current of moral compromises as if there is no Niagara Falls ahead. Get serious about your calling if you want to stay clean. Step number six, get the honest truth about holiness. Get the honest truth about holiness. You ask a hundred people what holiness is and you'll get a hundred and one different answers. And Peter's going to make it clear. And what I want to do is break down step number six into three subpoints as he describes holiness. First, holiness is comprehensive. Notice again the latter part of verse 15, in all your 
behavior. You could circle the word all. Uh, the Greek meaning of that word all is all. Y you might write that in the margin. In all, your, you could render that, conduct, how you act. I in other words, in all of the different areas, all of the different aspects, uh, all of the different decisions, all of the different concerns, all of the different genres and venues where you are found. Holiness is comprehensive. Now that doesn't mean you got to wear a starch shirt and a necktie to the grocery store. That doesn't mean you got to try to read your Bible where you, while you're changing the tires on a customer's automobile. It, it certainly doesn't mean you've written out a long list you're going to tape to the dash of your car of do's and don'ts and you're going to review them in the morning. Now keep in mind that if holiness is only a list of do's and don'ts, then you've actually missed your calling. You've missed the object of your holy preoccupation. In all your pursuit of holiness, how easy it is to run past Him, to overlook Him. And He just, as it were, stands there while we run through our list. As you genuinely pursue Him, Peter makes us aware that everything will belong then to Him comprehensively, which means you don't talk one way in church today and another way on the golf course. Christ invades your vocabulary out there too, or in the cubicle, or in the shop, or on a weekend camping trip. And we have the impression that, you know, in here we're going to, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more, you know, differently, sacredly. We all, you know, sort of get our tones mellow and everything's a bless you and a brother. And just wait till Monday. We're a few days away from an election. I'm sure you didn't know that <laughs> already. And you need to vote, by the way. And don't do what one of my seminary students did this week when he voted early. He told me in class this week, he wrote in my name. I said, you didn't. He laughed. He said, I did. He's attending another seminary now. Um, <laughs> vote. Exercise your privilege as a citizen of this beloved country. You're not just voting for a person. You're voting for a worldview, a platform, future justices as well. But you know what the problem is in this election year? And every year I've voted as an adult, by the way. It's the same problem. It doesn't take long for the public to discover that candidates have compartmentalized in some way their integrity and their honesty and their sense of right and wrong. And it isn't long before many of the candidates are delivering speeches that sort of go like this. You can trust me in this area, but never mind about that area. You can respect me for what I said over here, but just ignore what I said over there. I'm honest about this issue, never mind dishonesty in that issue. And it isn't long before we're all holding our noses. What an election this year. Beloved, this happens to be a fantastic opportunity to demonstrate the contrast in the lifestyle of the believer. And we have individuals in our own church family who are running for office. What, what a wonderful opportunity to show the distinction of a comprehensive holiness. Integrity and honesty and purity doesn't just show up on Sunday or in this area or that area, but in every area. And those who are serious about their calling and, and get the truth about holiness understand that. There are no closets. There, there are no dark corners. There are no secret business deals. There are no filthy conversations in private. There's no dishonest posturing for, for gain financially or for the approval of man. Our passionate preoccupation happens to be the holiness and the glory of God. And so in that, we are immediately different. When Justin wrote his Apologia in the second century, his defense of Christianity sometime before he was martyred, hence the name Justin Martyr, he wrote specifically to the, the Roman emperor, 
because that was the way you did it. It was polite and, and proper, and then it would just sort of spread out from there. But what's interesting in his apologia is that he gave, although he gave the normal defenses for the validity of Christianity and the truth claims of Christianity, he also challenged the emperor to examine the lives of Christians and observe, quote, their purity. Observe their purity. Can you imagine that argument being used today? And frankly, I'm not so concerned about the political world as I am the spiritual church world. Can you imagine some apologist writing to the President of the United States or to the CEO of the Bank of America or to the Chancellor of UNC or NC State or whatever and saying, look, what you need to do to validate the truth that I'm writing to you about Christianity is just check out the lives of your employees, check out the lives of your citizens, check out the lives of your students, and when you examine their lives, you will come to the conclusion that because they are so uniquely pure, Christianity must be uniquely true. And here's the tragedy, we're all feeling it right now, because that ought to be the argument today. It ought to be the apologia of our faith. Now, does that mean that Christians are perfect? Of course not. That's not what the word holy or holiness means. In fact, Peter uses here a common word for holy. You might write this into the margin. It, it simply is the word hagias, which means at its core, separate, or more woodenly, different, different. The temple in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, was called hagias. Not because the bricks and mortar had some kind of mystical spirituality about them, it just meant that this building is different from every other building. The, the Sabbath was called holy for the Israelite nation because Saturday was treated differently than the other days of the week. Likewise, the Christian is hagias, not because he's perfect, has some kind of mystical, you know, aura about him, but because he's simply different from non-Christians. We use the same word, by the way, in our English language. It's sort of fading, but, but it, it, it's a wonderful concept. When we refer to marriage as holy, matrimony. Is it holy matrimony because you married the perfect woman? Yes. Um, <laughs> Got to be careful where these illustrations take me. Uh, no, it isn't holy matrimony because a perfect woman and a perfect man united. It is considered hagios because that relationship is different than any other relationship. It's unique, different. It's separate. You have separated yourselves in this unique way from all others unto each other. By the way, you have in your lap a holy Bible. Does that mean those pages have some aura about them? This Biblion Bible. Biblion simply means book, but it's a holy book. That means it's different from every other. Just like these believers in the first century, a believer in the 21st century has a fantastic opportunity to reveal their hagiousness, if I could create a word in English, their differences. One New Testament scholar writing on this particular word said, there should be no part of our lives which does not savor the fragrance of holiness. So holiness is not compartmentalized. It is comprehensive. Secondly, holiness is not something new. In fact, notice the ending of verse 15 again. Be holy yourselves in all your behavior. Why? Because, implied, it is written. This isn't something Peter came up with. He didn't think it up one day and he thought, you know, it would really be great if Christians were Hagias, that they pursued the holiness of God. He's actually quoting here from the book of Leviticus. 
that place in your Bible where the pages stick together more than likely. The word holy shows up in that book of the Bible more than any other book of the Bible. It's in that book where God is revealing through Moses the difference and all the differences of the Israelite nation. And it's spelling it all out. God is revealing all the dietary distinctions and all the ceremonial uh, distinctions and commands, all the prescribed rituals and customs and regulations and laws that the people of Israel were to follow. And, and at the core of it all was God's desire that his people, his nation, distinctively reveal their covenant relationship with him that would be different than any other nation around them. And, and now what Peter does here, uh, uh, rightly so, in this New Testament dispensation, is drop out any mention of ceremonial or dietary or Sabbatarian or festival or custom or sacrificial requirements, and he simply repeats the core, the, the core command strips everything away and he says, look, this is just as relevant for this dispensation of grace as it was to these Old Testament believers in that dispensation of law. Be holy just like God is holy. Hasn't changed. And he prefaces it by saying, listen, this was written down a long time ago and it hasn't changed, so don't argue with me, argue with God. This is still true today. Holiness is not compartmentalized. Holiness is not something new. Thirdly, holiness is not something you create. Again, the core command, you shall be holy for or as I am holy. Holiness is not something you create. It's someone to whom you conform. Your calling is to pursue conformity to the character of God. And, and He works in you to will and to do of His good pleasure because you belong to Him. And He's already established in our last Lord's Day study this relationship between father and, and child. Children should grow up modeling than what they see in the lives of their parents. The last thing you want is for your children to begin modeling their lives after other children. I mentioned those three brothers of mine. You know, I never once heard my mother say to any of them, boys, what you need to do is start behaving like Stephen. <laughs> start acting like him. Now, that would be life-threatening. But what she often said is that we ought to grow up and act like our dad. Act like our dad. See, this is part of our problem when it comes to holiness, which is why we're so skewered in our thinking. We've forgotten him, and we're just acting like each other. And we're measuring ourselves against other people, and we found that we are actually a little bit holier, a little bit better off, and those other people, you know, maybe they'll catch up to us. You know, we've set our sights way too low. Peter elevates it to a work of God's Spirit, Stop creating your own self-made lists. In fact, I, I share with uh, my greenhouse class uh, one church father who was writing in the second century. He was asked by a young, zealous believer, a young man, uh, what it meant to live a holy life and how could he do it? What did he need to do? Unfortunately, the church father just kind of rolled out his little particular list and missed the point. We have some of his list extant today, and he wrote to this young man these words, forsake colored clothing. Remove everything in your wardrobe that is not white. Remove everything that isn't white. No longer sleep on a soft pillow or take warm baths. In other words, don't be comfortable in life. And, he continues, unfortunately, if you are sincere about following Christ in holiness, never shave your beard, for to shave is an attempt to improve on the work of Him who created it. My favorite Hebrew word comes to mind, pronounced baloney. <laughs> How many of you improved on the work of your Creator this morning before showing up? 
praise God from whom all blessings flow. I sure did. It's painful enough. The spirit is alive and well. I mean, when I grew up as a kid, you know, there were church leaders that thought it was sinful for a man to have a beard. And now this church leader is saying it's sinful if you shave your beard. You know, what do you do? Grow on this side and this side shave, somehow reach a compromise. Now, the, the truth is we pander to man-made rules because really what we're after is man-made approval. And our models are man-made. Peter here draws our focus back to the relationship of our Father. And in so doing, makes the point implicitly that holiness isn't going to be created by you. It's going to be the fruit of your calling. And God, who has given a calling, a special calling to all of us, He has given us a calling to Himself. You belong to Him. And He will do in your life and work in your life and in your family's lives distinctives and differences that may be unique to you so long as none of us uh, violate Scripture. You're going to make a thousand decisions on what it means to pursue this holiness. But this foundational relationship is primary. It's between father and child. Peter is effectively telling us to grow up and act like our father. We model after him. When he becomes our holy preoccupation, we, like him, become hagias a little bit here and there as he works in us. And that little area we'd tucked away, he puts a spotlight on. And what we were at one point satisfied with, what we at one point might have managed, we totally confess and plead His grace in removing it one day at a time. J. Allen Blair, now with the Lord, I'm enjoying his little commentary on this letter from Peter. He told about a meeting that took place between a Christian leader he knew and David Ben-Gurion, um, the first prime minister of Israel, called the father of Israel, modern Israel led in the formation of the, of, of the modern state of Israel. Born in 1886, he died in 1973. The Christian statesman that was a friend of Blair's took advantage of a private conversation he had with the prime minister to talk to him about his relationship with Jesus Christ as his Messiah. And, and Ben-Gurion was intrigued and open. In fact, he asked, and I'll just read the conversation. He asked him, are there any Christians in the world? Are, are there any Christians like the ones I find in the New Testament? I have read the entire New Testament in the Greek language, and I'm deeply moved by what I read. The teaching and the standard is wonderful, but where are those who live up to it? Are, are, are there really those who are living this Christian life today? Can this book produce that which it sets forth? The Christian statesman responded, he can indeed, Mr. Ben-Gurion. And then he told him of his own testimony and his life change, surrendered to Jesus Christ. And Ben-Gurion asked in total simplicity and transparency, are there others like you? Oh, yes, there are, the Christian affirmed. Ben-Gurion said, where are they then? Well, they are all around the world. Can you imagine? Are there any real Christians out there? Where are they? Where are they? Those who have accepted their calling in their vocation, to model the excellence and purity and integrity of God. Those who've been called out of darkness, who love the light, those who've accepted their calling to model the self-control of Christ, Peter writes, in the face of suffering. That's our calling. That's our preoccupation. Are, are there any real Christians out there answering the call? I found one in an unlikely place, 
Uh, two of our pastors are heading to India today. Uh, they've been invited to preach at a pastor's conference and, and uh, pray for Paul and Scott. But I'm reminded that on one preaching and ministry trip I took there, we went to several states, preached a number of rallies and, and in churches, and it was a long, it's an exhausting trip just getting there and back. In one city, I remember where we stayed for several nights in a, in a beautiful hotel. You almost had to go to the nicest one in order to know that everything was like it ought to be. One evening, I was going to preach to well over a thousand believers, and, and um, I will insert this too just for interest, your interest, but that, that service was so exuberant. My preaching was preceded by two hours of music. And all of these choirs from all these churches took turns, and they were all decked out in beautiful matching outfits. And after they sang, I preached. I spent the morning and the early afternoon in my hotel room preparing for that uh, message. And uh, the maid came in, a woman in her middle years, and, and I could sense you know, you've been there, you've seen this, but you just sort of sense this joy. I didn't say anything, but had a little conversation. She was very polite, very dedicated in the way she cleaned the room, very careful as she spoke to me in her broken English. The next day she was in the hallway again, and I greeted her, and again, just sent this sense of her dedication to her task and her spirit of, of joy. The following day as I was leaving, um, lugging my uh, suitcase down that long corridor, and, and she was standing by her cart of uh, supplies, and I stopped and I, I asked her a question that I knew could cause trouble for her if it was overheard, but I wanted to ask her anyway. And I said, ma'am, uh, if I can, I'd like to ask you, the, the, the excellent way in which you cleaned my room Every time I, I've seen you, there is this, this spirit of, of joy. I have to ask you, in a world surrounded by Hindus that is antagonistic to the gospel of Christianity, do you belong to Jesus Christ? And she immediately just beamed and she said, oh yes, I am a Christian. I'm a Christian. What did I have to go on? Her dedication to her job. Her countenance, which in that line of work, by the way, and in that world of incredible poverty is not the most conducive thing to a joyful spirit. It struck me later, you know, she will never deliver the gospel publicly to a thousand people in some rally. She, she may not even be known by a large body of believers, but she cleans hotel rooms, and you can tell it's, it's a demonstration of her preoccupied mind with the character of her God, her living Lord, who then through her gives this blessing to those around her, this hagias, this distinction and the fruit of it, which in what I sensed was joy. Are there any Christians in your part of the world? Let's answer that question tomorrow. But let's answer the call when we show up and take these steps in our desire to stay clean. Like Robert Murray McShane, let's, let's be awesome. Let's become awesome weapons in the hands of our holy God. It is the most amazing weapon that is the gospel in and through us because it transforms life from the inside out. And, and we're going to do that, not because God's going to give us some massive, you know, opportunity or some great display of talent, but because of, by means of a great likeness to Jesus Christ. 
who is our gracious redeeming 